question. And uh, it's great to have those kind of exchanges of opinion here. And thanks. thanks um, again. Thank, many thanks to all of you for attention, for good questions. I think the comment at the end was a very uh, was a very helpful one. Um, there, I also want We're leaving the last minute of this so we can join the Senate live as it gavels in. Live now to the floor of the Senate for debate today on reauthorization of the Export Import Bank and two judicial nominations. Oh God, our Father, strengthen our senators for today's challenges. Empower them with the courage of obedience so that in doing your will, they will find peace. Give them such trust in you that they may experience setbacks without ever doubting your providential leading. In all of their strivings, energize them with perseverance to bring each task to its appointed end. Lord, as they try to make good decisions, give them the light to see what they ought to do and the resolve to do it. May they ride out the storms of difficulties and discouragement with the knowledge that you will sustain them. We pray in your great name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., May 14, 2012, to the Senate. On the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Richard Blumenthal, a senator from the state of Connecticut, to perform the duties of the chair. It's on Daniel K. Noway, President Pro Tempore. Mr. President. The Majority Leader. I now move to proceed to calendar number 396, H.R. 2072. The clerk will report the motion. Motion to proceed to calendar number 396, H.R. 2072, an act to reauthorize the Export-Import Bank of the United States and for other purposes. Mr. President, we're now on the motion to proceed to the XM Bank Bill. We're working on an agreement to begin consideration of the bill. I don't know if we can reach that, but we're trying. At 4.30 today, the Senate will proceed to executive session to consider two United States District Judges from Maryland and Illinois. So at 5.30, there'll be up to three roll call votes. The first two will be on confirmation of Russell and Tharp, and the third will be on cloture on the motion to proceed to the XM Bank Bill. Mr. President, there was a time when legislation would reduce, would reduce the deficit and support hundreds of thousands of jobs would fly through the Senate with bipartisan support, but not so anymore. Instead, a worthy measure that would support 300,000 American jobs, the Export-Import Bank, may stall in the Senate in this, this evening. The holdup, more Republican obstructionism. Tonight, the Senate will vote on whether to end the filibuster of reauthorization of this most important legislation. The bank helps American companies grow and sell their products overseas. Last year, this bank financed 3,600 private companies had almost 300,000 jobs in more than 2,000 American communities. The last time the Senate considered this in legislation, it was offered by a Republican senator, and it passed by unanimous consent. What that means, it comes to the floor, sponsored by a Republican, and everybody agrees, and we don't even have a vote here. It's done by unanimous consent. So it's unfortunate I had to file cloture again. I filed cloture, 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 so many different things. We shouldn't have to argue over bipartisan proposals like this one. It should just pass as it has in the past. But I remain hopeful we can find a way to work together on it. The Export-Import Bank has the support of two groups that rarely see eye to eye, 
the Chamber of Commerce and Labor Unions. And today I got a letter, Mr. President, from the National Association of Manufacturers, as did every other senator. The national, it says, the National Association of Manufacturers, we refer to as NAM, the largest manufacturing association in the United States, representing manufacturers in every industrial sector in all 50 states, urges you to support the Export-Import Bank Reauthorization Act. The Export-Import Bank of the United States, referred to as XM Bank, is one of the only tools manufacturers in the United States have to counter hundreds of billions of dollars of export financing that foreign governments offer to their exporters. In 2010, Canada, France, and India provided seven times, and China and Brazil ten times, more export assistance as a shared GDP than did the United States. Exxon Bank levels a playing field for U.S. exporters by matching credit support other nations provide, ensuring that our nation's manufacturers can compete based upon the price and performance of their products. It also enables small and medium-sized manufacturers to capture new markets in emerging economies abroad. In 2010, the bank supported more than $41 billion in export sales from more than 3,600 companies, supporting approximately 290,000 jobs here, as I, rather than 300,000, I said, export-related American jobs. Denying XM reauthorization will hurt manufacturers every size and threaten thousands of U.S. manufacturing jobs. Small and medium-sized companies are particularly vulnerable, but those that receive direct XM bank support as well as those that supply larger companies. So manufacturers urge your support of H.R. 2072, which authorized the bank through September 2014 and provides a modest increase in its lending authority and enhances congressional oversight over the bank. <coughs> that letter is signed by one of the officers of the bank. Mr. President, this legislation has Republican co-sponsors. Now, why we have to go through this endless procedural process? Why can't we just pass it, as we've done in so many years past? They're saying, we want amendments. Amendments to kill the bill after saying they support the bill? The House passed this bill without amendment. Without amendment. I repeat, without amendment on a 330 to 93 vote last week. But that 93 kind of says it all, Mr. President. 93 is the mainstay of the Tea Party caucus in the House. They're opposed to everything, just like almost 50% of the Senate Republicans are against everything. That's what we have here. Even though there's outward support for this legislation, they want to kill this bill. They, want, they don't want government to have anything to do with our lives, period, nothing, which is unrealistic in this modern world and, in fact, in any world. This legislation is actually exactly the kind of smart investment Congress must make to keep the economy on a road to recovery. And it's the kind of consensus proposal that shouldn't require Democrats have to try to break a filibuster. When Senate Democrats brought this realization to the floor previously, in fact, in March, we assumed it would pass by a strong bipartisan vote. Surprise was here. The Republicans voted against it. Nearly unanimously, they voted against it in March, despite their public confessions of support for it. And, Mr. Mr. President, a day or two after they voted no, they send me a letter saying we've got to get this done. So they voted against in March. Now they're threatening to do it different reasons this time. They, want, they don't have enough amendments. They want amendments. So they're once again forcing us to run out the clock on this measure, which expires at the end of this month. Frankly, the behavior of my Republican colleagues over the last week has been a little baffling. They say they support our efforts to keep interest rates on federal loans from doubling for 7 million college students. They voted the proposal down. Now, a few days later, they say they support the XM Bank. But they voted it down once, and they're threatening to do it again. 
with Republicans willing to use every obstructionist tactic in the book, even some not in the book, even on bills they support. It's a wonder the Senate gets anything done at all. Further delay would allow the bank's lending authority to lapse, putting jobs at risk. But there's still time for my colleagues on the other side to reverse course. There's still time to work together to pass this measure. I understand my Republican colleagues want to offer amendments to the bill. I've already said so. Mr. President, their amendments generally would just eliminate the bank, not make it stronger, not lessen it a little bit, just gut the export-import bank, and some just eliminate it altogether. Even if those amendments weren't egregious, changing this legislation now will only waste more time. And we've been told the House isn't going to accept any amendments. But why would we accept an amendment that gets rid of the bank? The process of reauthorizing this bank has taken months already. There's really no reason to waste a minute more on this. American exporters are counting on us to get something done this week. So I hope my Republican colleagues will consider the consequence consequences of yet another filibuster and join Democrats to reauthorize this Export-Import Bank without delay. Would the Chair announce the business of the day? Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved at 4.30. Uh, under the previous order, the Senate will proceed to executive session at an appropriate time to consider the following nominations, which which the clerk will not report at this time. I would note the answer, Corn. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Gaga. And the Senate just gaveled in about 12 minutes ago. Majority Leader Harry Reid took the floor immediately after the pledge. He talked about the Export-Import Bank and the difficulty he's had in bringing the measure to the floor with enough votes to pass. The bank's charter is up at the end of the month. And as the New York Times caucus blog reports, the House voted to extend the charter. It was siding with some business groups over those who want to let the bank's charter lapse. Senator Reid said he had expected to take up the House bill quickly and pass it unchanged since it had overwhelming support in the House. But the New York Times blog continued there's a lot of bitterness before that House vote. Conservative political groups said the government chartered bank is essentially a government handout for big businesses that could leave taxpayers on the hook for billions of dollars in loan guarantees. And again, that's just some information on that export import bank from the New York Times caucus blog.
the senator from California. Mr. President, what is the parliamentary status at the moment? The Senate is in quorum call. I ask that the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that I be referred to to speak as if on morning business. Without objection. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, for about the past week, uh, I have been very concerned and involved in a situation evolving in Mongolia. It is a small country. It has been a democratic country for the past 20 years. At one time, uh, part of uh, the Soviet bloc, but no longer. And I've talked to many people, uh, the State Department, uh, the Vice President's office, uh, the head of the Brookings, chairman of Brookings, uh, the former ambassador uh, to Mongolia. So I come to the floor to address the situation of Mr. Nambarin Enkbayar, the former president of Mongolia from 2005 to 2009. I was in Mongolia when he was in, pres in president and had the opportunity to get to know him. As a distinguished international statesman who is sadly facing so-called allegations of corruption in the country he led so well and so long. Mr. Inkbayar, in addition to being president of the country, was previously prime minister and has held many other leadership positions in government over the years. As president, he designed and effectively executed Mongolia's third neighbor policy of diversifying its diplomatic and economic relations beyond the strong ties with its immediate neighbors, China and Russia. Specifically, Mr. Inkbayar, Inkbayar personally emphasized relations with the United States, with our Asian allies such as Japan, Korea, and Australia, and with Europe. At the request of the Bush administration, he dispatched Mongolian troops to fight alongside Americans in Iraq and Afghanistan. He held two summits with President Bush and concluded Mongolia's Millennium Challenge Pact in 2007. Under his leadership, the Mongolian government strengthened its international peacekeeping role with the United Nations, joined and then took a leading role in the community of democracies, provided humanitarian transit for North Korean refugees through Mongolia, and developed important intelligence exchanges with American counterparts. Domestically, Mr. Enkbayar contributed to Mongolia's political maturation with his graceful concession and cooperation after he lost his re-election bid in the 2009 presidential election to Mr. Elba George, the current president of Mongolia. This smooth transition of the presidency from one party to another at that time did much to solidify the foundations of democratic politics in the country. Sadly, the atmosphere in Mongolia has become less conducive to such fair play this year, as Mongolia approaches an important parliamentary election in June. After retiring from politics, with the end of his presidential term in 2009, Mr. Inkbiar re-entered the public arena again this year with the formation of a third major political party, and the fielding of a slate of candidates, including for himself, for the parliament. Just as the campaigning for this election was starting in earnest a month ago, Mr. Enkbayar was arrested under charges brought by the Anti-Corruption Agency of Mongolia, an organization established while he was president. It's important to say that building practices of good governance and challenging corrupt practices form an important benchmark of achievement for any developing democracy. We should applaud vigorous efforts to combat corrupt practices in the country. That is needed. But it is equally important that those fighting corruption avoid a sense of involvement in such practices themselves. Certainly, to say the least, the bringing of charges against the political leader in the midst of an important election campaign is, to say the least, unusual. As extraordinary 
as the timing of the charges, the process of Mr. Enkbayar's subsequent arrest and incarceration was of even more concern. Mr. Enkbayar was ostensibly wanted for questioning, but on the evening and early morning of April 12, 13, 12 and 13, he was forcefully removed from his home by several hundred law enforcement officials and without any resistance on his part, and then spirited away for confinement in a remote prison where all access was severely limited. In incarceration, Mr. Enkbayar suffered further indignities and irregularity, irregularities of due process. He had inadequate access to family and counsel. He reportedly received abusive verbal treatment. After initiating a dry hunger strike without liquids to protest these circumstances, which is his right under international law as a prisoner, he was denied adequate medical treatment and endured attempts to force feed him. Only after his health was at risk, Mr. Enkbayar was released on bail this morning so he could receive the medical treatment he so desperately needs. It is my sincere hope that he will be well enough to continue with his campaign for Parliament. Yet, I am deeply concerned that he may still be charged with corruption, allegations that have been deemed by one of its, his attorneys to be, and I quote, insubstantial, stale, and petty, end quote. Mr. President, our concern now should be, in the first instance, Mr. Enkbayar's health and even his physical survival of this ordeal. Secondly, we need to press for due process in the adjudication of his case and ensure he is afforded his full rights to a speedy, transparent, and fair hearing of the charges with full legal assistance with his defense. We cannot be sure at this time that either of these considerations, the minimum that is owed any citizen, any human being under the rule of law in a democracy can be secured. So, I call upon the authorities of Mongolia to announce that the procedures and schedule for adjudication of his case will proceed and that President Enkbayar will be accorded full due process rights to which he is entitled. To do less would be to reinforce fears the process employed here is politically driven and meant exclusively to remove Mr. Enkbayar from participation in the parliamentary election now underway. Finally, Mr. President, this brings me to the larger issue concerning fears for the fate of Mongolian democracy and for the now strong relationship between Mongolia and the United States. Mongolia has been rightly acclaimed for the extraordinary progress it has made in building democratic practices and institutions since the collapse of the Soviet Union 20 years ago. Indeed, Mongolia is the only successful functioning democracy from the Pacific Ocean to Eastern Europe through the entire expanse of inner Asia. A small country, it has, due to this achievement, become a country of large significance on the world stage. The best argument that a free and brave people can move their country from authoritarianism to democracy in a relatively short period of time. Having done so, Mongolians have enjoyed an extraordinary degree of support and attention from the outside world, led by our country, the United States. The Mongolian-American relationship now encompasses Mongolia's impressive economic potential as it develops its rich mineral resources with the help of foreign partners, many of them American companies with a strong interest in investment there. However, all this promise could be negatively impacted by the emergence of the practices we have seen in the case of Mr. Enkbayar. The chill of intimidation is felt by every Mongolian citizen, for 
If such treatment can be applied to a former president and still popular leader, no one is safe. And then such harsh treatment tends to bring reciprocity, and the country is in danger of falling into a vicious cycle of political score settling. For the sake of Mongolia and the future of its people, the country's leaders must step away from this risk immediately. It is equally true that once having lost one's good reputation, it is almost impossible to restore it. There is still time for Mongolia's authorities to correct a dangerous turn of events probably no one expected or wanted. There are many friends abroad, including this senator, pray that they will do so. Should the troubling circumstance of Mr. Enkbayar's case continue, it would thereafter be impossible for America's friends, excuse me, Mongolia's friends in America and around the world in other democracies to continue speaking with the hope, promise, and optimism for the country's future with which we have for the last two decades. Much is at stake in Mongolia now. Its political leaders and people have been wise and skillful in choosing the right course in many times of challenges and crises in the past. So I call upon our friends there to help their country, their supporters and themselves by taking the humane and lawful actions that are needed now to reclaim the reputation at the forefront of the communities of democracies. I hope it is, had, has been obvious that I speak as a friend, a concerned friend, but one who wishes Mongolia well. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Arizona. Mr. President, before I begin my remarks, let me compliment the Senator from California not only on what she just said, but also on remarks that she had on television yesterday concerning the danger to our country when people uh, leak information uh, relating to our effort to defeat terrorists, which make it all the more difficult for us to accomplish our job and undercut the mission of the many, many men and women in military, in our intelligence services, and civilian forces of the government and, frankly, in the governments of allies uh, who are working very hard uh, to uh, identify and, uh, and prevent terrorism from occurring. And then when leaks like this occur, uh, it undercuts that effort tremendously. And I, I thought the Senator from California did a very good job pointing out how that is so and why we have to go over the people who are responsible. Senator, yield for Absolutely. a comment. Um, Senator, I can't thank you enough for those comments. I am really very worried about this leak. I was just reading the London news clips, and um, as you know, I chair the Senate Intelligence Committee, and I believe I can speak for the leadership of both committees in saying we have not been briefed. This has been very closely held because of the seriousness of the operation. And to see what is now in the papers, which essentially endanger the asset, put him in fear of his life, tell our allies we cannot be trusted to carry out a mission without leaking that mission, um, and also uh, thereby alerting al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula that they need to increase their security uh, to prevent penetration. It is, I think, the most serious leak, certainly in the time I've been president excuse me, I've been chairman of the committee, and I really thank you for raising it and for your solidarity in that belief. Well, thank you, and again, I, I compliment the chairman of the committee for uh, very wise remarks, and I know that the ranking member, uh, Senator Chambliss, is in full accord. This is a very bipartisan effort, and I hope that uh, we can succeed in getting to the bottom of it. Uh, Mr. President, I wanted to talk today uh, a little bit about uh, unemployment in the economy. There have been a lot of news stories uh, some very serious as the one we just discussed, some a little bit more frivolous that um, I think are distracting from what I believe is the top domestic problem in our country today, the lagging economy and high unemployment. So I'd like to refocus a little bit on that today, and especially what we could do about it versus what we are or are not doing about it. Uh, there are some very troubling economic trends, and um, I think maybe uh, we can make some recommendations to the President here 
about how we could help to get out of the ditch that we're in. The administration, uh, unfortunately, has been claiming that the economy is continuing to heal and touting the, the latest jobs report. Um, and I think that that misleads the American people. Um, and, and here's why. It is, it is true that by their measure, the unemployment rate has declined from 8.2 to 8.1 percent. But that doesn't really represent progress if you look behind the numbers. If you look behind the numbers and the actual employment data, employers added only 115,000 jobs last month. That's less than the 180,000 that Wall Street was expecting. And more importantly, it's less than the 150,000 jobs that have to be created each month just to keep up with the new entrance into the workforce. The kids graduating from college, for example, those graduating from high school that are entering the workforce. In order to keep up with that number, about 150,000 per month, the private sector has to create that many jobs to stay at zero. And if it doesn't, then we're actually getting behind. So the fact that we, we've had uh, several straight months where there's been an actual increase in the number of jobs created doesn't really measure the success properly. You have to measure it those months where job creation was above 150,000, and in that case, less than half um, of the months since the president has been in office have met that, that criteria. So we're actually sliding backward, not moving forward. Uh, here's another way to look at the unemployment picture. Um, there are so many people who have given up looking for work under the Obama economy now that they don't show up in the unemployment statistics. That's why this number 8.2 actually goes down to 8.1. Not because there are a lot more people finding work, but rather because a whole lot of people have stopped looking for work. So they're not counted in the unemployed uh, looking for work. In March, for example, there were about three people dropping out of the system for every one job created. Think of that. In April, the rate was 4.5 dropouts per new job. So each month, we're finding more and more people are simply not looking for work. They're dropping out of that group of people who would like to be employed, who are looking for work. They've stopped, so they don't show in the unemployment numbers. In fact, in the month of April, 522,000 people dropped out of the labor force. Now remember, last month 115,000 jobs were created, and some people thought that was great. Well, it's nice that it was 115 and not, you know, none, but the reality is if 522,000 people dropped out of the labor force that same month, it shows you that there is just not much to cheer about. What that meant in terms of overall statistics was that a number that the Labor Department calls the labor force participation rate. In other words, how many of the people who could be working here are actually working? It dropped to 63.6%, which is the lowest level since 1981 when we were headed into a big recession at that time. In other words, we have fewer people actually working in this country as a percentage of those who could than at any time since 1981. Uh, James uh, Pethokoukos of the American, Institute, excuse me, American Enterprise Institute said this, quote, if the size of the labor force as a share of the total population was the same as it was when Barack Obama took office, 65.7 then versus 63.6 .6 today, the unemployment rate would be 11.1 percent, end of quote. 11.1 percent. That's why you hear people say the real unemployment rate is not 8.1 percent, it's 11 point one percent. What that means is the more people give up looking for work, the better the official unemployment number gets. But it doesn't tell the real story. Pethokoukos also noted, and I'm quoting, if the participation rate just stayed where it was last month, the unemployment rate would have risen to 8.4 percent. So you see the unemployment rate is primarily a factor of how many people are still looking for work. And if they've given up, then they don't show in these statistics anymore. This is very, very troubling because it also shows that Americans do not see their situation uh, bettering. They don't have a sense of optimism that things are getting better. There's a resignation 
uh, beginning to uh, be created here that things aren't going to get better and there's no point in me trying to look for work. And of course that has ramifications up and down the economy, a couple of which I'll, I'll, I'll mention here. Um, because there's this view that the economy is not really continuing to heal, as the president said, um, you've got very sluggish economic growth um, back at the, at the very same point in the Reagan recovery, the very same point that the, President Obama's at right now. At that time, economic growth was 6.1 percent. Today, it's 2.4 percent under the Obama economy. Uh, Social Security disability claims are rising, and they're rising dramatically. What it shows is that instead of people continuing to look for work, they're filing for disability, and a lot of them are getting on disability. We've had a tremendous increase in disability claims uh, and, and uh, determinations of disability in this country. More Americans are using food stamps that, uh, than at any other point in our history. One out of two recent college graduates can't find a job or are underemployed for their skill. I just gave a commencement address uh, Saturday and um, uh, talking to some of the students about what they were going to be doing. Uh, most of them had something to do, but a lot of kids do not have a job, even though they've spent four, five, six years and untold thousands of dollars getting a college education. Senator Thune recently noted that the poverty rate among women has reached a 17-year high, and that there are nearly 700,000 fewer women working today than when President Obama took office. Now, I don't mean to divide this into gender or, or any other kind of group, but the reality is that groups in this country suffer when we have poor economic growth, when we aren't creating enough jobs. And if you want to get it right down to what kind of people are having a problem, Here's the situation, 700,000 fewer women working today than when President Obama took office. 22.8 million Americans remain unemployed or underemployed or are only marginally attached to the workforce. These are 22.8 million Americans that could be working productively. And if they were, our economy would be doing much better. And guess what would also be happening? People would be earning income and paying income taxes, the government would have more revenue, and we would be better able to afford all of the things that the American people expect of the government. The number of long-term unemployed has increased by 89% under the Obama administration. These are the people who have been out of work for a long period of time, at least six months, many of them more than a year. And all of this as the cost of living for middle-income uh, Americans soars. For example, worker health insurance has gone up 23% even after Obamacare. Gas prices are now about $4 a, a, a gallon. They have doubled since President Obama took office. Home values nationwide have plunged by 14% in my state of Arizona. In many places, it's by 50%. So, Mr. President, instead of creating a to-do list for the Senate, as the President has done just six months before the election here, uh, asking us to vote on what a lot of people call show votes and uh, dividing the country by pitting one group against another, I, I would urge the President, make some real steps to steady the economy and reassure the job creators. And let me give you four specific examples of what the President could do to lead and what I think Congress would be willing to do uh, to follow. First of all, and, and a couple of, are, uh, of these things are uh, to stop doing something that's bad. A lot of people say usually government can do best by just getting out of the way because we have a very robust private sector if it is not too tied down with government regulation and taxation. So the first suggestion I have is let's stop the largest tax increase that will automatically occur it's the largest tax increase in the history of our country. It's going to occur on January 1st. You said, what? I didn't hear about that. Well, this is the so-called Bush tax cuts. You know, 10 years ago, Congress passed these, but they had a limit of 10 years on them. Actually, it was a, a, a shorter period than that. They were extended two years ago uh, because the president said it would be bad for the economy if these tax rates were allowed to go up. And he was right. He was right then, and he's right today. It would be bad for the economy. It would be bad for businesses, especially small businesses. It would be bad for the American family. And yet, 
Uh, here we have automatically, if Congress does not act and the President does not act, every one of the marginal income tax rates will go up. Things like the marriage tax penalty, the child tax credit, the capital gains rate, dividends tax rate, the death tax rate. All of these increase, and it combines for the largest increase in the country of the world. And if you're looking at economic growth, you talk about a wet blanket, you talk about something that will kill economic recovery, that kind of a tax increase, taking the money out of the private sector and giving it to government, uh, is about the worst, worst medicine that you can think of. And so my hope is that the President will lead, that the Congress will provide the support necessary to extend our current tax code and to ensure that we don't have the biggest tax increase in the history of the country. I mentioned taxation and regulation. Well, regulation is number two. Over 28,000 pages of new federal regulations have been added to the books in just this calendar year. Think about it, 28,000 pages. You think of going to the store and reading and buying a book of two or 250 pages, maybe 300 pages if it's a really big one. How about 28,000 pages of new federal regulations just this year? Bureaucracies like the National Labor Relations Board and the Environmental Protection Agency continue to churn out rules and regulations that confuse job creators and hamper their ability to expand and hire. Just to give you one example where because of a public outcry, uh, they finally said, okay, the Department of Labor won't issue these regulations, basically saying the kids couldn't work on the family farm. Now, many of us worked on family farms. Maybe we didn't like it at the time, but we'll all agree it did us a lot of good. And the reality is it's not something the federal government ought to be poking its nose into. So there was finally enough political pushback on that from the FFA and the 4-H clubs and uh, the Farm Bureau and uh, really everybody that was sensible about looking at it, that they pulled it back. But unless the American people pressure, you know, push back against this stuff, bureaucrats in the federal government are going to continue to figure that they can run our lives better than we can do it ourselves. One of the biggest in terms of regulations is Obamacare. It's made the regulatory state much bigger and much more expansive. It's resulted in an estimated 58.5 million annual paperwork hours, according to the American Action Forum. 58.5 million annual paperwork hours. I've talked to businessmen, I've talked to medical offices and so on. They're going nuts trying to figure out how to deal with all of these new regulations. The House of Representatives has passed numerous bills that would reduce the regulatory burden that Washington imposes on the economy, but the President and the Senate Democratic leadership have uh, refused to bring those to the Senate floor. So that's the second thing that we could do. It, it, it all boils down to this. We should rely more on the power of freedom than on the power of government. And if we do, the American people will do the rest. So let's stop this biggest tax increase in the history of the country. Let's stop issuing these burdensome regulations. And how about the third thing, American energy? We could be one of, if not the most energy wealthy countries in the world, just taking advantage of our own resources. We could no longer have to be dependent on the Middle East for our uh, sources of energy. But unfortunately, here too, the President and the Senate Democrats have repeatedly pursued tax increases on the oil and gas industries, would raise the cost of gasoline, increase our dependence on foreign oil. According to the Congressional Research Service, they're the nonpartisan entity that looks into these things when we ask them. Instead of basing an energy strategy on punitive tax hikes, we think it would be better if the President would just work with us, work with the House of Representatives, to expand, expand the development of domestic resources offshore, on our federal lands, in Alaska. We have plenty of oil and gas. We have plenty of other kinds of reserves of energy that could make this country not just no longer dependent on the Middle East, but uh, much wealthier than we are today. And part of that is just simply approving the Keystone Pipeline. This isn't even American resources. It's in Canada. They meet all of their environmental requirements. It doesn't damage the environment here in the United States. They've already done the environmental reviews for the pipeline. There are thousands of pipelines crisscrossing our country. This pipeline is not going to create an economic problem for our country, excuse me, an environmental problem. 
The president has said, well, the part that goes from Oklahoma down to Texas, that's fine with him, but not the part that requires EPA's go-ahead. So that's the third thing. Let's have an energy policy that takes advantage of what we have, including uh, approving the Keystone Pipeline. Now, finally, what the president and our Democratic friends here in the Senate could do is to join the House of Representatives and clear the deck of all of the legislation that's been piling up here on the Senate floor that isn't getting done, that we all know has to get done before the end of the year. These things are not optional. This is our homework. This is stuff we have to do. And it's all being put aside for the lame duck session. The lame duck session is the time in between the election when new members of Congress have been elected and the time they're sworn in. Essentially, at the end of the first week in November to the first week in January. I'll be a lame duck. I'm not running for re-election. I'd rather that the new senator from my state make the decision about the future of the country. But because all of these things are piling up, I'll be one of the people here making these decisions for the future of our country. I don't mind being here, but it will be very bad for the country to pile up all of these things and expect to get them done smartly in the five or six weeks that surround Thanksgiving and Christmas. Well, what are some of these things? First of all, just funding the government, the appropriation bills. Nobody expects that we are going to complete work on all of the appropriation bills to run the government, as a result of which we'll have to, at the end of the year, pile a whole bunch of things into what have been called omnibus appropriation bills. Omnibus meaning we throw everything into the same pot. The problem with that when coupled with the fact that the Senate hasn't approved a budget in three years and won't approve a budget this year, presumably, is that nothing is prioritized. It's just basically a continuation of the spending from years past. So we're not making the critical decisions about dropping this and adding this that, are, that would provide more sensible funding of our federal government. So that's the first thing we'd ought to be doing. And that leads me to the second thing. We've been borrowing so much money that it is very clear that we are going to run once, up, once again up against the debt ceiling. We've borrowed so much that we have to increase the debt ceiling in order to pay that money that we've borrowed. Nobody likes to do it. Nobody likes to say they voted to increase the debt ceiling. Well, then why vote to incur the debt in the first place? Oh, we have no trouble doing that. At least some members of this body in the, in the House don't. But the reality is that when those people have incurred that much spending, you have to pay the debt, and that means the debt ceiling have, has to be raised. And when will this come to pass? Right after the election. Wouldn't want to take it up before the election. Might remind the American people about how much, too much, we're spending. Forty cents on every dollar that we spend in this country, we had to borrow. So the debt ceiling is something we're going to have to, uh, to, to deal with. Here's one of the biggest of all. Sequestration. We agreed in the Budget Control Act last year that we would save about a billion, excuse me, about a trillion dollars over 10 years on discretionary spending. And we would try to save another 1.5 trillion from mandatory spending, the so-called entitlement programs, the programs that are really costing us big bucks, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and there are a whole variety of other programs that are included in the entitlement spending. Nobody's talking about ending these programs as we know them. I mean, what politician is going to call an end to Social Security or Medicare? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about effectuating savings. There is a huge amount of waste and fraud and abuse that everybody acknowledges. We could save billions of dollars in all of these programs, and we need to do that. We need to save $1.2 trillion is the actual amount required by law over 10 years. When you subtract interest, that comes out to about $908 billion, or $918 billion, I've forgotten which, each year. So some of us have introduced legislation to uh, pay for this $900 plus billion dollars, uh, for next year to offset with spending reductions the uh, cost of this sequestration. Sequestration is a fancy word for across-the-board spending cuts. Half of them go directly to the Department of Defense. The other half are spread across all of the other programs in our budget, from education, housing, you name it. But what makes more sense? Just taking a meat ax and lopping off the top 10% or top 12% or whatever it might be 
of the spending in all these different programs? Would you like to buy four-fifths of an airplane in the military? Does that make sense, or does it make more sense to say, let's save $10 here so we can spend $10 over here? Obviously, it makes more sense to do that. Everybody assumes that somehow we're going to avoid sequestration in the lame duck session of Congress. Who's doing anything about it? Well, some of us have introduced legislation. And we hope that this week in the House of Representatives, they will be able to amend the defense authorization bill by adding a provision that says that the numbers in that bill assume that we have resolved this sequestration problem as a way to begin the discussion so that we can begin the negotiation so that we can find a solution that both houses will agree to, both political parties will agree to. This shouldn't be partisan. Everybody loses if sequestration occurs. So let's solve that problem, and let's solve it before we get to the lame duck session. That's the third thing we can do. Everybody familiar with our tax code knows that there's a fourth thing. We've got something that happens each year. There are 60 provisions of the tax code that expire every year. We have to renew them, and we do. So let's get about it. They've already expired. These are the so-called tax extenders extending certain provisions of the tax code that everybody wants to see extended that have already expired. We need to do it retroactively to the first of the year. Everybody knows we're going to extend most of them. Maybe we won't do all of them. We need to do that. So why not? Let's get that done. We know that there are other things that are occurring. There's something called the doc fix. Each year we have to figure out how we're going to pay the doctors who take care of Medicare patients. It costs a lot of money. But if you don't pay them, we're not going to have any doctors to take care of Medicare patients. So it's always a dance. Well, we've got to figure out how to pay the doctors. And the reality is, as I said, if you don't pay them, then we have only ourselves to blame when our uh, senior citizens uh, can't find a doctor to take care of them when they need that care. There are other things as well. The payroll tax holiday expires uh, and... and, and there, there are many other things that we need to do as part of our business as representatives and senators. This isn't optional. These are the things to keep the government running, to do the things that we promised our constituents in legislation that we would do. So my fourth suggestion here is let's start working on these big problems. Many of us who will be in a lame duck position are putting a letter together to our leadership asking them to please tackle these big problems. We shouldn't be voting on a lot of these things. We should be done as of the uh, uh, end of the year. But uh, if, if we have to, we will. It's not that we aren't ready for the work. It's that these things should be done before the election. And this is my last point. Why, you ask, why if these are things that we are supposed to do, the appropriations, dealing with the tax code, because it will automatically have a big tax increase if we don't, the sequestration, the debt ceiling, uh, paying the doctors. If we have to do all of these things, why are we putting them off? Well, here's the dirty little secret. Because if we actually tackled them, we'd have to make some tough decisions. If we made tough decisions, we'd have to take votes. If we take votes, those votes are going to be on the record. And if those votes are on the record before the election, our constituents will know what we really think and how we act. And some of them may not like it. And so we don't want to be on the record, some of my colleagues say. Again, doesn't bother me. I'm not running for re-election. We don't want to be on the record before the election. It's a little bit like when the president leaned over to the then president of Russia, Dmitry Medvedev, and he said, look, he said, after my last election, I'll have a lot more flexibility to deal with these issues. You tell Vladimir. Well, after the election, it's too late. The people have cast their ballots. Shouldn't the politicians be willing to say before the election what they stand for? And instead of just making campaign promises, how about taking votes on real issues so that the American people know where they stand? And then they can make an informed judgment. I like this person over that person because I like the way this person voted or I don't like the way that person voted. That's what democracy is supposed to be all about. You make the tough decisions, you stand for election, the people either say yes or no, and then, by the way, they hold you at account. After you're elected, they continue to watch how you vote to decide whether they want to vote for you again. 
But in this day and age, we're played in hide the ball from the American people. Let's just don't bring anything up until after the election. That way the American people won't see how we really feel about these things. Now, some of these are tough votes, I acknowledge. It's, it's hard to figure out how to effectuate savings. If you have to come up with uh, $100 billion in savings over 10 years, something has to go. So you can't promise everything to everybody. You actually have to find $100 billion in savings somewhere. And Senator McCain and I and uh, Cornyn and Ayotte and Rubio and Graham and some others have introduced legislation to say, here's how we would do it. If somebody has a different way of looking at it, tell us. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you the way we would do it. You can save $100 billion by just doing two things. When people leave government employment, instead of hiring somebody to replace them, we would hire two people for every three that leave. Now, the Bull Simpson Commission says only hire one for every three that leave. So we're being a lot more liberal than Bull Simpson. We say every time three people leave the government, let's only hire two back. I'll bet we could get by as a country uh, doing that. And the other thing is the president uh, froze uh, increases in federal salaries, and we would simply extend that freeze through the middle of 2014. Now, there are other ways to do it. There are hundreds of billions of dollars to be saved. If you got a better idea, we're all for it. But at least come up with something. And don't be afraid to vote on things. The American people are, are pretty smart. They get this stuff, and they know that there's no free lunch. They know that government costs money, and they know you can't save money by continuing to promise everything to everybody. So I just urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, leadership in both the House and Senate, let's get serious about this stuff. First of all, let's not raise taxes. Let's reduce regulations. Let's have a real energy policy, and let's get our work done the work that we know has to be done, and let it, let's get it done as soon as we can. That would give families and businesses the knowledge of how to plan for the future. That would help them understand what they have to deal with and not have to incur this huge uncertainty which is so much of a drag on our economy today. These are four constructive suggestions, Mr. President. There's a lot more that we could do, but when our economy is in as bad a shape as it is right now, and it's not getting much better. We have this many people not even looking for work anymore. We need to do something more than, than just be out on the campaign hustings and talking small ball and trying to blame it on the other side. Let's get to work, follow these four ideas, and I think we could make tremendous progress to get our country moving again. And frankly, if we did, I think the American people would reward us. They would say, thank you. Thanks for finally doing something here. That's what we sent you back here for, and we'll reward you for it. So ironically, good politics is always turns, excuse me, good policy turns out to be good politics. And I think we need a little bit more good policy. Mr. President, I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akanka.